Hello, everybody. Um, it's just about 11 o'clock. Uh, welcome to my talk, Redesigning Legacy Systems, Keys to Success, Lessons Learned. My name is Pete Muldoon, and uh, welcome to my uh, brand new talk. So um, I'm a senior software engineer in Bloomberg. I've been there a number of years. However, uh, prior to joining Bloomberg, I was a consultant for about 21 years. Um, and it, it, it had a lot of assignments and I've been around. So it's been about 30 plus years in the software industry. And I just tried to distill some of the things I've seen and the lessons I've learned into how to get a legacy system out the door. Um, again, I'm with Bloomberg today, but this is a talk that draws not on just on my time on Bloomberg, but on my time in the industry as a whole. And how can we redesign or rewrite legacy systems without putting a product out there that is um, you know, laden with tech debt um, or has a lot of the problems of what the previous system has. Uh, and although this is um, canted towards uh, redesigning uh, systems, uh, it can also be used for systems that you're designing from scratch, but parts of it will not be applicable. So anyway, with that said, um, let's get going. If you have questions, uh, if you could please take a note of the slide number, they're in the bottom right-hand corner, and it just makes it easier to look at the material and not have to hunt around for it. All right then, so what is a legacy system? Well, if you go to the Oxford English Dictionary, it says that a legacy denotes are relating to software or hardware that has been superseded, but is difficult to replace because of its wide use. And I think that's a really good definition, um, especially the difficult to replace, because if it's easy to do, it just gets done. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to define legacy just as the current software in production. Now, people can come to me and say, hey, this software is brand new. It's only been in production a year. Well, a legacy clock has started on it from the time we're into production. Um, so let's look at the second part of what we're talking about. What is a system? Well, interestingly enough, a system is defined by being a system of intercommunicating components based on software forming part of a computer system, which is hardware and software. This came from, I believe, Wikipedia. For the purposes of my talk, I just want it to be a set of intercommunicating components, which itself may form part of a larger system. And what this means is that where I'm looking to take this talk is not on some grand high scale replacing of a, you know, a really huge enterprise system, but you can take a system that is a part of a larger system and redo it, okay? Um, so it's not have, you know, lofty up there with a lot of management goals. It's, it's very close to where the code has been written. More or less, this is for the people who are going to write and design that, that code. The question you might get asked is why do you want to redesign or rewrite code? Why not leave well enough alone? Um, rewrites can be scary. You can have bad outcomes. And uh, there was a guy, Joel Spolsky, who wrote a pretty uh, well-distributed paper on things never to do. And he says, you should never rewrite a, a large system that all the hard-earned knowledge that's in there is needed. And people believe they can write better code because it's harder to read code than to write it. And, you, and, and it's more fun. Okay. Uh, he took Netscape and he showed that while well, Netscape was sort of at a standstill, its competitors ate it up while I tried to do a rewrite and it was kind of stuck in, in that loop. But um, I think that uh, Joel sort of took a, a narrow view of things. I mean, there are, I think, plenty of places where a rewrite has turned out to be phenomenally successful. So Linux was a rewrite of the existing Unix and, uh, you know, it's very good today. Lots of people moving to using it. Um, GCC was a right rewrite of compilers that were proprietary to, I don't know, we had compilers in SOM and AIX, Windows. So um, it's not a foregone conclusion that you will, you know, come, become a cropper if you do something like a rewrite or a redesign. So will a partial rewrite do? 
And what do we mean by a partial rewrite? Well, that's where you modify a part of the existing code. So you don't have to worry about the whole uh, task or application itself. You can just focus on a piece of the task. And I put ports when you port something over in the same categories of partial rewrite. So I port it from, I don't know, legacy C to the modern C++. I port it from one database it's using to another. Um, there's large parts of the code you don't have to uh, look at. And rewrites will get you, or partial rewrites, will get you a surprisingly far as far as extending the lifetime or um, uh, abating problems in the current system. Uh, there's plenty of times I've been brought in for a system that has been slated for a rewrite. And it turns out that proper analysis of how the data was flowing through the system shows that you, know, you just have to substitute or rearrange some part of that system. But let's say you've decided that um, you know, the partial rewrite is not the way to go. So what are your possible reasons for moving to a new, a completely new application or taking a, a, a set of inter, you know, communicating parts and replacing them? Well, one uh, that used to come up, admittedly, I think this was more early on in my uh, career, was that the machine or the software reached an end of life status. So um, I was on a repo system that was running on really, really old machines. And the idea became that it needed a rewrite so that we could run it on the new machines and the new versions of C++ and stuff that was on that machine. Um, another instance, um, there was a repo system where the uh, underlying uh, library was, it was a third party dependency, was actually too slow. But it turned out that they had deprecated that library in favor of writing a library in Java, which had a lot more load balancing. Um, so there, a rewrite was mandated because we had to move to a Java uh, application. So that's one reason you might have uh, rewrites. Um, the other reason is we have throughput or latency, right? A system was built when loads were much smaller. Uh, we didn't have so much threading going on, or these days we'll, we'll look back probably in the future and say, well, we were threading when we should be co-routining. Um, the load was smaller and a system that's been around a long time will kind of organically grow be a lot of different people on it, a lot of different, um, I don't know, I don't want to say hacks, but a lot of different enhancements done in different ways. And it becomes, you know, pretty uh, hard to maintain. And that's the next reason we come up against, right? The maintainability, the reliability of the code is, is tough. I touch one place in the code and it seems to fall over someplace else. It's, uh, it's very tightly coupled. Uh, I'm not sure of how the operational logic is there. And there may be large parts of the code that are rarely used or actually are not used anymore. We just don't know it because it's, it, it's such a large uh, code base. So these are, I guess, what you might call uh, internal factors. You, you come up with them yourself and you say, this is the reason why I think it's done. But you can have it come from the outside. All right, you get someone from upstairs and the management chain says, we're going, it's been decided, we're going to rewrite or redesign this part of the system or this system. And you go, okay, I'll, I'll take it on. Other times it's just because you're not really sure, but it's kind of got in the air there that the system is, uh, is having trouble. Let's just rewrite it. And the other category is one-off events. I don't know if any uh, people were around during the Y2K era where we were going from a two-digit year to a four-digit year. And the, uh, the problem was, oh, when we go to the year 2000, all the computer programs around the world are going to think we're in 1900 and lots of bad things will happen. And although I believe that could have been done very cheaply, it was one of the largest spends on software design because most people took that as an opportunity to rewrite systems that had been sort of lagging or bogging down from a variety of the system of the uh, reasons we have above. And, uh, you know, Linux migration, uh, something going on where I am today, we want to migrate to Linux and 
uh, you know, we say we don't want to do a port. We'd rather not just do a straight port and, you know, bash on it till we get it to compile and then bash on it till it runs. We'd rather rewrite the system and, and use better practices than they have been used in the past. So these are the reasons. And let's say for whatever the reason, um, we're going to start a new project where we're going to take some part of a system and we're going to say, let's rewrite and we're going to redesign it. So we've gotten the okay for the project start. We're full of enthusiasm. And because we're full of enthusiasm, we'll, you know, we have lofty goals. We believe we can do much better jobs. And our idea of the problem uh, is going to allow for really nice modern solutions. And then we end up making re unrealistic deadlines because we're, you know, we're very enthusiastic and we'll more or less promise the world to anybody who's looking for it. And then we'll go off and we'll go into our simple uh, dev demos and we'll create some simple programs that act as kind of proof of concepts. And this first line here, I call the, uh, the honeymoon phase of the project. There's no real you know, crunch, there's no feeling of time pressures, uh, very optimistic and upbeat. So we, you know, we're in a, a really good place. But then we get to the next phase of the project where we have what I call real world trouble. Now, what I mean by real world trouble is you take your simple dev um, programs, which were, you know, almost like the hello world of the applications you're going to create. And then you try and make it duplicate what the real system is doing. You start running into edge cases. You start running into arbitrary splitting and complexity that you don't believe should be there. Um, more or less what happens is it takes your very clean design and puts pressure on you to make it sort of arbitrary and random and kind of hacked up again. And that's that's what happened in the, in the original application, real world messiness triumphed. And you don't really want that to happen. So next you go on and you have scope creep and you have sort of an implicit scope creep in that your idea of how the problem could be solved was an incomplete analysis of the problem. It's more complicated, so you have to do more. You might not have allowed for that. Uh, also, you have explicit scope creep where um, it's something I found in projects where instead of writing code for just what we need, we can have a view to where we're going to go and maybe other phases of the project. But we try and solve problems now that don't need to be solved now. All right. And because we've had this kind of middle ground, it turns out we've missed some of our deadlines. And it's maybe not so bad when you miss them the first time. I say it's not as bad when you miss a deadline. It's how much of a... Um, you know, how much of a gap you've given for people to get used to the idea, I'm going to miss my deadline in a month is, I think, easier to, um, to absorb than my deadline tomorrow is not actually going to be made. Uh, you give last minute notification. So now you've missed the deadline. Now we're feeling the crunch and we're getting into the, uh, the latter part of trying to get this design out the door. There's time pressures, we feel, you know, management breathing down our necks, and then we start hacking the design, we make compromises, we start taking something and instead of having nice clean lines, we say, for now, we'll do it this way, and we'll come back. So we start loading some tech debt in, but we do it as an expediency. But that's kind of what happened in the original process. No, everybody's in a full gallop, we're running like crazy. How, where are we on the project? I don't know, but we have to get this, this, this done, and hopefully we can get it out the door. But we're not really sure where we are because we didn't properly chart it out. And then we miss our deadlines again. And again, this is a, you know, a timeline I have seen happen in uh, quite a few projects. Uh, some I have joined and some that I've, uh, I've looked on from sister groups. But once I miss the deadlines again, well, now, you know, I'm in real trouble. What can I do? Is the project a failure? Now, probably, you know, if you have enough visibility, the project won't be given as a, a failure straight off the bat. And what happens is instead of your project being a failure, you'll end up coming back here to the hacking the design piece. And you'll say, okay, I'll 
continue on again. And I'm in this kind of loop of hacking the design, not sure what my progress is because I'm so busy. I don't have time to look at my progress and I miss deadlines again. And, you know, in the end, I either deliver something that's uh, maybe a buggy, maybe very stripped down in functionality. I haven't done it on budget or haven't done it on time. Is the project a failure? Um, maybe, maybe that's a that's a judgment call. But given that's the case, is there something we can do where we can go down a sort of different timeline to this to stack our odds that we will get something out the door properly? Give ourselves a better chance. And I think the R, and I'm going to present this as a series of keys. And the first key I think you need is the ingredients. It's like if you're baking a cake, you need to know what kind of cake you're baking and uh, what the tools are to do it, right? So what are the first things we need before we start out? Well, I think you need a definition of success, or some kind of proving ground. How can I tell that I have accomplished the project? Um, it's nice if you can find a problem and this, this problem goes away when I'm done. So that kind of is a really easy way to say, look, well, there's been problems in the production system and there likely are. I mean, why are we rewriting it? Because there's probably problems. So get these problem or problems set together and say, this will be gone. And this will help you, help you eliminate uh, a lot of scope creep. So I can say, here's the scope of my project. This is what I'm going to do. Um, if you don't have a problem, it gets a little more fuzzy. You have to go on to metrics and say, okay, the current system does, I don't know, 20 requests a second. I'm going to do 500 requests a second. And you go, okay, that's my measurement of success. But you come along and you deliver a system that produces, you know, can handle 200 requests a second. Is that a failure? Probably not. It just means your metrics were kind of pulled out of the air. They weren't really based on reality. So the other thing you're going to need is once you know where you're trying to get is who's going to go on the journey with you. And it's good to have historical system knowledge. In other words, some kind of knowledge of the system as it is today. Uh, that will help you disentangle the current system, that uh, the logic that's there, which if it's an older system will probably be very convoluted and maybe not apparent. Um, it'll provide context on, you look in here and go, why on earth would this be going on? There may be a good reason for it, right? And if you have some historical context, you know about it. And it'll show you, it'll also give you some of the current pain points. Um, so this will give you some idea of the history of what's going on with the current system. And as the philosopher George Centeniana said, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. True enough. But I think uh, those who are stuck in the past are also due to uh, repeat it. In other words, you need to not just have uh, developers that were there from the old system, especially if they've been working on it a long time. It can be hard to think outside the box they've been in uh, for that length of time. The next thing is design architectural experience. Do you have uh, someone on, on the team who has proven that they can be creative with design, a proven track record? and um, to use one of, I think, Sean Perrin's idioms is seasoned. In other words, they've been around a while, they've seen some things, and we can maybe, you know, not have to go down the same problems again. Again, it's something to sort of, you know, cut out to going down the wrong tracks. Then I also think you need a dab of new blood because they bring the creativity, novel perspectives. Let's try this. I would never have thought that or that. Well, that's ridiculous. Oh, on second thoughts, the way you present it, it's not so ridiculous. So you need a blend. And if your team is really small or it's just you, you have to go out and get the historical system knowledge. Hopefully you have some design appearance, uh, design experience and your new blood. Uh, you have to sort of go out and sort of talk to people and you know say, hey, what do you think? So the last thing I'm gonna mention is business or market buy-in. Buy -in. Um, I know as programmers, we don't like to look at the, uh, the business end of things, but really that will give you visibility and visibility will give you, you know, some ability to move this project forward. And, uh, it also lets you know that here's things that the old system does badly. So you don't want to duplicate the old system. The old system may be doing functionality that 
no one cares about are doing something badly. So again, business market buy-in will give you some idea of how you can make something better, which will mean when you bring your system out, people will have a reason to move to it. Okay. Next key. Um, and this is something that would be specific to designing a legacy system is analyzing how the data flows through the current system. And it would be surprising how many times I've seen this particular piece ignored. We just say, I think I have a feeling what's going on and we blast off. But I think you need to gather both um, qualitative and quantitative intelligence. In other words, where are the peak loads in the system and how is the system handling it? Are we having some kind of latency problems? And if they are, where are these latency problems? So I can find the I can find the actual problems. And then the next thing is input composition. So most systems will do a large variety of things. You may need to zoom down and say, you know, there's a particular category of input that is the problem. The other ones are done not too bad. It's running fine. So maybe I'm just gonna pull that out into my new system. All right. Um, but again, you know, we have to look for this data and it's usually there, but that comes back to the, um, I guess the quandary of that may involve you going back into your current legacy system and adding some, uh, some instrumentation. I need to know what the latencies are. We never put it in there. It's usually not hard to find at least the input and outputs of um, a system and put some timing on it so you can sort of see where the, uh, the latencies are. Once you have this, you can then, you know, you've confirmed what your intuition, your feeling on it. You can uncover misconceptions. And I've seen before where I've gone in and look at the data and like, wow. And I thought the problem was here. I, I would liken it to having a car saying my car goes too slow and I go buy, you know, someone goes buys me a sports car. The reason it's too slow is because I, I, you know, I have a trailer on the back of it and I need torque. Uh, so a sports car is not what I need. I need a truck. So I need to know where the problems are so I can solve them. And again, once I have these, uh, this uh, intelligence, I can apply my own tests and say, what if I did this? How would that affect what I'm seeing in the real data? You can hypothesize what the outcomes are. And then this thing is crucial to innovating and producing a design that will tackle the problems as they have been shown by the data. From there, you can map strategic goals, meaning that my system phase one, limited in scope, will do this. But you know, I can see phase two, phase three, that will bring more and more functionality in. And all as I will say is I think that, um, this is the most underused design asset in a legacy redesign, is that you can base your design on data evidence. It's like an evidence-based design. Um, it's golden, if you can do it. And if you're a new system, you don't have this. You have to make guesses, you know, put it out there, hopefully get some feedback from actual production users. But on a legacy system, it's just sitting there waiting for you to, to, to take a grab of. You don't have to extrapolate and take a best guess from your, from your dev. All right, so once we have that, the next uh, key is the key to system design. And for here, I say the key is design over technology. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, I think you can produce your design first based on the data you've looked at in the previous section, how it flows through the system, where the problems are, and produce a design that tackles those problems and takes care of them. After that, you can plug in your implementation technologies. Um, I say design is technology agnostic to a large degree. I mean, you know, depending on, you could maybe put in most any database and adapt your design to fit to it. All right, um, your distribution to your front ends, how are you going to send it and uh, notify? Again, you know, one that just does that, you can pretty much substitute most everything in. However, I think in the industry we are in, the inclination is to believe that systemic problems can be solved by technology. Um, in the old days, it was taught a slow system was just, we need more, better hardware. All right, uh, Moore's Law would take care of it, if you've seen. Um, uh, 
Kevin's talk in CPP Con, Performance Matters, he shows that that used to hold, but it doesn't hold these days. Uh, the other thing you have to be careful is to avoid mimicking the legacy design with just new technologies. And in, in, in my vocabulary, that's a port. In other words, I'm just taking the, the functions, or the applications, the interconnecting pieces, and done exactly the same thing with different names on them. And let me show you that. So I've actually seen things like this, where we have a system roughly described by this. We have input coming in on the left via fix externally. We have some preprocessor that puts it into our own data uh, encapsulation, how we carry data around. That sends it on to someplace else uh, where it gets enriched with uh, various reference data. And then that goes on for the core handling, core business handling. We, um, you know, we, we put our persistence into some kind of database here at Sybase. And then we broadcast it here over TIB, which is the Technicon Information Bus, bus very popular back in the day. And someone comes along and shows me the new plan that they have is this. All right, so let me just go back again. So here we have the old system and here we have the new system. And it's presented as a rewrite or a redesign. Um, all as we've done is we've used uh, MQ now to, to uh, communicate between the processes instead of um, some TCP we might have written earlier. Uh, all the processes are now called the new process. Um, and I have a real problem with people naming their process, you know, process underscore new, because 10 years from now, it's not going to be new. And that's how you see processes called, you know, proc underscore new two or new to three. And then we save it to Cassandra. Um, is that really getting you much of anything as far as your problem goes? Well, no, but Cassandra is kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's hip, it's nice to talk about. And, and of course, instead of using TIB, I'm using Kafka now and I have K listeners. This is a straight up port. It's not a redesign. And if you have systemic problems, I'm pretty sure this is not going to work. So again, try not to mimic the legacy design. You need sort of a new thinking, uh, new eyes. Um, and, and just to summarize, the underlying technology is usually not the answer. Uh, it's nice, but should probably believe to after you've come up with a design, then plug your technologies in. Again, I'm not saying that you can't take a port and make it work much better, but then there was no need to redesign the system. All you needed to do was go in and modify as a partial rewrite the old system. Unfortunately, and I shake my head sometimes, and uh, is that buzzwords and unrealistic expectations are the norm. So when we try to get a project off the ground, we fill it with as much terminology as we can, and it wins approval. Um, way back in the day when C++ was still relatively new, but Java was brand new, um, people would come with an idea for rewriting the system in Java. Under the pretense, it would perform better. And at that time, Java was not certainly not pre-compiled and really slow. And it was like, really? And just how do you expect to make that language run faster than C++? You can't. And, uh, you know, I'll prove it if you want. Uh, but the idea was putting Java in there was very hot. That's where you're going to get approval. And it was a lot of projects lifted off the ground because of that. Now, let's just talk a little about new technologies. <clears throat> There was a guy, Dan McKinley, who wrote um, an article about choose boring technology. And he talks about the fact that new technology that you don't know, there's a long learning curve and it can be really painful. So new, tech, uh, new technology, and by new, I mean it's new to you or it's new to your group or your company. Not that it's new in the wide world, but it's something that you don't have experience with. Uh, it can be easy to introduce, but hell to live with, uh, you know, and outside of the demos you're doing in dev, um, which is nicely carefully crafted, um, you know, demos, you go to use it in reality and you find out that there's problems. And these problems will really translate when you're in production. How mature is the product? How responsive is it to having problems uh, solved? What is your product level integration? In other words, is 
is your production set up to monitor this this kind of thing or is it going to you know be kind of falling on to you to do it um, one thing about new technologies i found is they don't advertise problems only benefits uh, going back to java not to pick on it but it was like run uh, right once run anywhere it's great it's maybe right once uh, and run anywhere but you're probably going to run it slower anywhere that was never advertised at least back then um, again you'll find these unknown unknowns only through hard practice so even technology that you're you know quite sick of or you can't stand you know you know it you know what's going wrong inside of it and you know, there's known problems, but the unknown unknowns are much larger in brand new technology. And this is not to say don't use new technology, but just that be judicious in its use. You know, pick it here and there, and certainly don't pick uh, new technologies that, two, two new technologies that map to the same problem domain. I was trying to have as few technologies as you can. Again, I may be swimming against the current there. But I think one of the things we don't do enough um, in our industry is talk about, uh, well, the current implementation technologies I have in the old system, can I use them right now, right? In other words, if, if, I, if I just took my current design and tried to plug in what I have today, how would it look? And, you know, that might save you quite a lot of pain and development time. Uh, not that you shouldn't use any new technology. Some will maybe be showing their age and you swap them out, but you don't just gratuitously say that every technology you ever come across needs to be replaced in my new design. Okay, so <clears throat> how, how are we doing? And that's what we're talking about when we say the key to charting progress. And I say the project should be staged with deliverable milestones and tasks. Um, as, uh, as a preamble, let's just get some of these definitions out of the way. To me, a deliverable is just some observable outcome of the project. I can see it, I can feel it, I can touch it, right? Milestones are checkpoints throughout the life of the project to say that we've hit some notable point. I've, I've hit a point where all of a set of tasks or deliverables I've, I've hit on. Let's go on to the next one. And then finally, tasks. And tasks are the small packets of work that allow you to get the deliverables down, which allow you to reach your milestones. These tasks should be short in scope because they give you a resolution on how, on, you know, how small your tasks are, give you a resolution on where you are on the timeline, the resolution of how far you are along on your timeline. I mean, I liken it to if I was um, building a house. And uh, I just go to the builder. I like a really nice house that's very comfortable to live in. Uh, give me two floors. And what do you think? And he says, I'll build you a house. It'll cost, you know, uh, X hundred thousand dollars and come back in three months. And I say, OK. And I just wander off and I show up three months later with my uh, trailer of stuff from moving in. I've gotten rid of my old dwelling. Uh, chances are I'm going to not be moving into that house, right? I need some kind of schedule. I need to say, look, um, I'll give you, you know, quarter of the budget and uh, at what, two weeks in, I'm going to get the foundations and the subfloor done. Then I'll give you another part of the budget when that's done and you'll give me walls and a, and a roof and maybe internal uh, room designations. And then I'll give you another to put windows and doors and dry it in so the elements can't get in. And we have a stage set of deliverables that I can come along and see. And chances are that if I'm doing it that way, when I come back at the end with my trailer full of stuff in three months that, you know, I do have a house to move in. So again, we need a plan. And for this, we should have attainable or realistic um, deliverables. And that is a bit of a judgment call. Uh, but, you know, it should be something that your, your analysis at the beginning has allowed you to define the scope. And allow, not that scope won't change, but you'll try and, you know, limit the creep of it. And like I say, these things should be observable. Uh, hopefully directly when you do a deliverable, I've just hit a deliverable. Here, take a look. It should be, you know, show me some sort of additional functionality. Or show me that I can say, look, look at the load handling characteristics of this thing when it runs. 
But it needs to be charitable. Uh, like I said before, just saying that, hey, I have a final prod deliverable. It's going to be given to you in a year and a half. Come back and see me then I think is useless. You're not going to know how the prog project is going. And like I say, if we stage it as milestones, deliverables, and then we take those deliverables, we, fall, we get down into tasks. What's going to happen is we're going to have... Uh, and this is where I, I want to make a distinction. It's like, how does this affect the end product? We want to do product management as opposed to project management, which project management can get somewhat esoteric in, look, I have all my bits and pieces here. Here's how they're going to sit together. And it becomes, look at this, and it's very nice to look at. And it may not hinge on reality at all. So again, a product management, my decisions, where am I on the timeline of getting these things out the door? All right, so focus on the product. And again, uh, you know, this is not to say, do not go into sort of atomic level tasking. In other words, that you bury yourself in red tape. It's, it's enough to help you. And again, these, these keys are meant to get you closer to getting a project. They're not laws or commandments or, you know, something that's given to you. You must, thou shalt not. But you should try and get here. And the closer you get here, I think the closer you'll get to um, delivering a product. And overall, my idea is functionality or code metrics over feelings. In other words, let me show you what I'm doing. When someone says, how is the project going? I feel it's going pretty well. I feel, you know, I, I think that's, well, that's one part of what we have when we have deadlines getting missed is because I feel it's going well. Uh, I, I had a wrong idea. Or we just don't want to tell people what they don't want to hear, right? Uh, so the big rollout's going to happen in a month's time. Yes, yes, and internally, you don't believe that. So functionality and code metrics over feelings and focus on the product. Next thing, key to moving forwards, I think is iterative and adaptive improvement. And that's where that thing I call real world trouble starts showing up. As someone uh, I heard said, quality is the result of consistent incremental improvement. Um, and that's important because trying to say at the very beginning, here's the whole scope of the project, here's everything we have to do and sort of fall into what was called the waterfall model, um, you're, not, you're not getting that incremental improvement. So how do we go about that? Well, I think we have to know that uh, iteration will approach perfection in a sane manner. Uh, I think it approaches it asymptotically, meaning it, it kind of goes like this, the amount of effort and how close you're getting to perfection. <clears throat> Excuse me. But again, trying to solve <clears throat> everything up front and say that <clears throat> uh, what we came up with in the beginning of the project is what we're holding to all the way through. We're not adapting to the real world. Uh, that's a mistake, right? We have to have an, iterate, an iteration to, to keep us on track. And part of this is not to go look at very far-fetched scenarios or even say, look, in other phases of the project, I'm going to be doing X, so let me do some of that work here while I'm here. Because remember that, um, that sort of timeline I showed, which had the three rows. When you're in that initial part of the project, you, know, you, you just have the feeling that time is not really passing when it most assuredly is. And again, you know, you have to be aware of scope creep when you're doing this uh, adaptation. So you iterate, adapt, then iterate, adapt, but try and keep your scope creep down because you know, that is what is going to kill you, letting your, your project get away from you. Um, again, we'll have small tasks. We're going to say, here's what we need to get done. Um, if they start becoming longer and longer, it usually means you misunderstood, misunderstood the task. Again, you got to adapt. <clears throat> you didn't properly understand the requirements and maybe you have to go back and do an iteration on the requirements or you take this task and you say, it should be actually a set of independent tasks. But again, it will give you the resolution Keep your resolution down to three to five days or a week at most, not up to months. And as a continuing team, which I'll keep talking about here, the real world is messy, <clears throat> right? It just doesn't follow clean lines. 
And But we do have to struggle to adhere to our design goals and overall vision. We have a vision that we do to some extent lock down in the beginning. And we'll try and we'll try and keep to that. So that we don't get tech debt, we don't get hacking. Try and hold your overall <clears throat> vision. Now, if the current design that you have runs up against a terminal, what I call a terminal mismatch with reality, uh, then the design needs to evolve, right? Um, holding to something that doesn't map to the real world is a mistake. You have to be flexible. I had this happen in a project I was in where we had this idea of a, an order with suborders. And the idea was that when you look down this tree, they could never look back up. And it's a nice idea, but it ran into the real world problem of the suborders affected the other orders as well. It needed to know about them. Uh, when I showed this and proved it was something that was going on in the project, the idea was, well, how can we hide the circular dependency? Can we kind of type erase it, you know, since you void pointer it? That was not the way to go to try and make reality or, you know, try and squint enough to make it conform to our design. And in the end, we did evolve our design and doing that opened up, a, we were actually trying to apply a state machine to how the, uh, the logic was applied. And that just opened up a whole new vista of simplifications we could do as far as using a state machine to track our progress through transactions. So again, terminal mismatch with reality, you need to evolve your design. If you try to do perfection in the beginning, it's just going to push deadlines over and over and over the, the, the horizon. <clears throat> so we're the key to delivering the product, I think, is shortening the feedback loops, right? So we know we have feedback loops. Iteration is good. Uh, and given that iteration is the key to delivering a working system or a deliverable product, we need to identify where they are. Right, And once we identify them, try and get an idea how we can shorten these loops. So I took a look, and here is the loop. So I'll start with compilation and linking. In other words, your, your coding doesn't make sense to the compiler or the linker while you get feedback, and you've got to fix it. So that's one sort of feedback. Uh, assuming you have a, a, a something that will compile and run, the next thing is you probably want some unit tests to figure out, you know, are we doing it correctly? Uh, then you have code reviews. In other words, you're, do, you're getting the correct answers, but are you doing it in a reasonable manner? Are we doing it in a way that's extensible, in a way that's maintainable? Uh, maybe after that, you have um, automated system integration testing. So uh, to test the system as a whole, uh, work which unit tests can't do. Then you have other pieces that look at your development process, like sprint retros, planning. So what you're trying to do is the process that produces code, can you tighten that up? And that's another feedback loop. We have alarms, <clears throat> something's gone wrong. I, I move my, uh, my redesign into the beta, I get a bunch of alarms. Okay, that's something I now will start working on. You have a QA group. You know, they run their own QA tests. It's an independent tester. Maybe comes back with more problems, another feedback loop. You've dashboards and metrics. You can look and see how am I doing. And then you have users and early adopters. This may be a, a mix of, you know, your business people within the company, your business liaisons looking at it, or some, uh, you know, early users who know the system is, is in development. And then finally, production usage. We have it out there, something goes wrong, the, uh, the client doesn't like it, and he says, hey, there's a problem. So this is a, a list, there may be more, but this is what I could come up with as far as an exhaustive list. But as far as the feedback loops I want to look at, I'm going to shrink it down to unit testing, system integration testing, code reviews, alarms, QA, and production usage. Now, if you omit, this testing. So let's look at the testing. I've put rough time frames. Unit testing will give you feedback in about a minute. Integration testing, maybe 15 minutes, half an hour. Code reviews, a day or two. Uh, alarms just happen whenever they happen. QA, well, there's a weekly or bi weekly or monthly cycle. So I get feedback from then, you know, once, uh, uh, once a week or once, uh, you know, once every two weeks. Our production usage, in other words, as the problems happen, it comes in, it can take months for a problem to show up. So if I omit 
something, let's say I don't do a unit test for something, well, then the problem migrates up to being caught on the next level. So maybe the system integration testing will catch it. If I don't have system integration testing, it migrates up. So problems tend to migrate up. And if it manages to get by anything you have, or you just you know, decide I don't have alarms and I don't have QA, well, then production is where it's going to eventually migrate to, which is arguably the worst place to be doing your, your iterative loop. It's, it's long and it's, it's very visible. So we want to try and push things down in the loop. So we want to have most of our problems be caught by unit testing. If system integration catches a test or QA catches a test or production catches a test, I want to write a test, a unit test that will catch that if I can, put it in, have my test fail, and then fix it. So problems will try and migrate up to longer and longer iterations, which is what will kill your delivery. We want to push them as far down. So that's what I mean by shortening the feedback loops. Try and get your, uh, you know, your unit testing comprehensive and not say we have you know, some unit testing, we'll see how it goes. And incidentally, why if you get a problem anywhere else, you should make a unit test catch it first and then go on. All righty. So let's talk about the key to understanding your system health. So, and I call that building in observability. Um, so uh, reliability engineering SRE has been making a, you know, it's, I think it's following the same kind of track these days that unit testing used to take. These days it's pretty prevalent to say we need unit testing, but I know if you've been on uh, an older system, there isn't any unit tests and people complain that there is no way of putting them in. So these days it's pretty common to say we need unit tests, but um, having performance metrics on a system, I still don't think that's quite caught on yet. So let's look at some metrics. I think you, as a, as a minimum, you probably need to happen. And again, I'm leaning towards transactional based systems here, which is where most of my experience has been, but you can take this and maybe adapt it to where you are. But there is this th idea of the four golden metrics, and that involves latency, how much time it took to service a request, the response time. All right, that's a good indication of how your system's doing. If the latency gets too long, you're going to have unhappy clients. Uh, the throughput of your system. In other words, when I start loading the system up, does the latency go get longer. So I may not have a, a particularly uh, low latency system, but let's say versus throughput, the latency doesn't get affected. Uh, something then looking at saturation. How is the overall utilization of capacity, capacity of my system doing? Um, you know, this can be what is my percent CPU running? Uh, how much RAM am I using? The disk space? What's my queue depth? Um, stuff like this, right? Um, how am I doing as far as my saturation goes? And then errors. You know, what is my rate of failing requests to total requests, assuming they're well formed? And again, failing requests does not mean you told the user he's doing an error. It means you didn't handle it properly. So these are, I think, on um, most transactional systems, sort of four things you probably want to know about. Um, the above is a good start. It's not exhaustive. In other words, I think there, there will probably be metrics within the overall latency from start to finish that you're interested in. Maybe how long you know, it takes to do the database persistence, how long it does to come back from getting, the, you know, getting it distributed via some kind of uh, some subscription notification message. But it is surprising that we have lots of systems which don't have these metrics really in them. I, I liken it to having a to driving a car with no dashboard. I don't know what speed I'm going. I don't know how the engine revs are doing, what the temperature on my engine is. I'm, you know, I'm just saying that I'll drive my car until I guess a, a policeman pulls me over or the engine explodes because I've no idea how good the car is doing. So again, we need some idea to say how our new system is going to run. There are drawbacks as, as with anything, too much of a good thing it may not be a good thing. Uh, potential drawbacks are as if you have a system in place that you, you know, your company or you have something where metrics come, essentially you just drop something in and you get them for free. Uh, 
people start metric in everything. We get metrics for metrics sake. Uh, my current project, I, I talk about this in that we have a metric in everything. And if I was to look at what metrics are actually meaningful, I think it would be a, a low percentage because people are, you know, they believe that it's free. And I don't believe it's free, but it's, you should just have the meaningful metrics. And again, you have meaningful metrics, some problem happens and you go, I could have seen that on my metrics. Uh, Okay, add it, right? Add it when you need it. When you have tons and tons of metrics, it's hard to link them up, hard to figure out how they all come together. Give me an overview of the system. And in larger systems, your metrics will probably be just a subset of the, the whole round trip. And, you know, they end up used, being used retroactively. Hey, you know, I got a problem. Oh, wow, yeah, I'm going to go back and look at that metric for last night. I see where the problem is. Hmm, interesting. Let's move on. And that's just not the way we should be doing things. We should be learning from mistakes and errors. And that brings me to eyes on glass needs to be replaced by alarming on metrics cresting particular levels. What do I mean by eyes on glass? I mean that, you know, be like, again, go back to my car analogy that I don't have any warning lights. In other words, I have to be sitting and looking at my car dashboard to know what's going on with it. And when I'm looking at the car, the car dashboard, you know, my uh, I go off the road and into a ditch or something. So it's good when I have a flashing light here, I need your attention. Oh, my oil lights out, my light, I don't have oil in my engine. Let me pull over again. We need to have alarms on these metrics that we do. It's not just good enough to have metrics and I can go there at particular times of the day and look. As long as I'm looking at a time when an hour happens, well, great. Uh, that's very error prone, right? What we should be doing is adding alarms to stuff. So I want to alarm on what I call bad hours. Uh, surprisingly tricky to say what a bad hour is, right? Because a bad hour is when the intentions are not met or you have an, hour, an undesirable outcome and it's not due to what anything the user really has done. And again, going back to someone asked me to do something in my program and the program goes, you can't do that, right? Um, okay, that's not an error. That's successfully handled requests where the user was an error. So I would say an error is where you ask me to do something. Maybe I shouldn't do it. I should have done it in, this, in some other way, but I handled it in the wrong way. It was undesirable outcome. And I probably have some cleanup to do with it. Um, process has been done, multiple restarts, right? Uh, these kind of things usually checked when a process is coming up. Uh, you know, if it's, I have some of my dependencies are not available. I mentioned that here. We don't come up. We stay down. That's a very visible way of getting uh, some attention, right, from our support group or uh, the developers themselves, depending on how big our company is. But we do a much poorer job, I think, of having these, um, you know, meaningful metrics alarmed. In other words, I hit particular watermarks or crest particular levels. Um, what am I doing? All right, uh, something like the retries per minute. Uh, you know what? I've been hitting my database and um, X retries have happened in the last hour, in the last five minutes. You pick uh, the granularity. Okay, I want alarm on that. I don't want, you know, excessive slowness coming in from customers. The request latency goes above a certain time. Uh, usually, if you're using a system to be more statistical, it will be like uh, request latency goes above X time for a certain percentage in a particular time frame. Okay, so that's starting to trend towards getting too high. Uh, we want to get there before other people do, right? And other things is looking for the saturation. What's our queue size? Our queue size has hit 80%. Okay, alarm on that because we may have a problem coming up where we're gonna blow through our buffer and the whole system needs to, you know, be usually when stuff like happens, certainly in transactional systems, something's gone rogue, right? Either externally or internally, let's catch it before it takes the system out. And again, you know, meaningful metrics will give you that. But <clears throat> something I come up against is, <clears throat> People will ask me, well, I'm, you know, the subsystem is really small. Maybe I'm just doing a particular task. 
can I apply this idea to smaller rewrites? Um, and it's really easy to say, oh, yes, you should do it every time. All, you know, it doesn't matter what. And to quote Calvin from yesterday, it depends. All right. I think it probably should be done unless you're part of a system that has got metrics on you. All right. And they come and say, well, hey, you know what? You're taking too long or we're having problems with you. You're giving us errors. All right. Maybe that's something where you can skip uh, having meaningful metrics. But I think in the main, you should probably, again, try and do this. And if you can do this, life will be sweeter. And now we're moving on to the latter part of the project. We need to roll out the product. It is, uh, after all, the whole point, right? I need to roll something out. But when I'm going to roll out, certainly on transactional systems, how am I going to move my clients or my users? Am I going to do it by functionality or by client? Because lots of times this is a, um, a choice you will have. In other words, I wasn't able to duplicate the whole system, top to bottom, all the 10 years of arbitrariness and quirky stuff going on. I probably won't be able to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I have to pick some part of the functionality. Or I can do it by client and I can say, you know what, I'll pick smaller clients in the beginning. They'll give me some feedback. And then when I get to the really large, important clients, um, you know, I'll have a system that's been properly tested. But I think what you have to ask yourself about your rollout is where will the tail be and who will be on it? And what I, what I mean by the tail is who are the last people to get on your system? And if you partition by functionality, by and large, and your data, that your data analysis of what flows your input composition should show you what's going on as far as if you partitioned it by functionality, right? Are you going to pull in that business of large multi-method clients that are doing a very diverse set of business, are doing a very diverse set of operations, and I'm going to take the most common of these operations and pull them over? Even though that's going to leave some percentage on the old system, it's going to be the very, the, the more trickier, the, the harder to implement. And conversely, the, la, the, la, the lesser value. Now, if I partition my client, <clears throat> I'm going to have to move clients over in the order of the amount of functionality they use. And that usually means that low volume uh, clients will be the first to come over. I do certain, a certain amount of tasks or types of operation on a few trades. They'll come over first. And the really large important clients will not move until you're near the very end. And that tail can be years out. And as I heard one business analyst uh, say, no one's celebrating moving an important large volume client right to a redesigned product five years after it's first rolled out. It was almost, uh, instead of celebration, a collective groan that finally we've gotten there. All right. So I think you need to know where the tail is and move people on the, the large volume clients again on. One other thing, which is a <clears throat> personal observation of mine is, because you've had these iterative loops and hopefully part of that iteration has been business people or even new clients uh, um, that are helping you get the system up, to, up and running, you'll have a system that may well have benefits that the old system does not have, does new operations that they didn't think or um, hadn't come up in discussions in the old system. Try as much as you can not to backport these benefits to the old system, because doing that is going to give people a reason to stay in the old system. You don't want to be sort of piece by piece moving stuff you've discovered in your uh, new system into the old system so people just stay there. All right. So uh, resist that. Uh, I'm not saying you uh, give this as a reason to upper management, but you say, you, you know, you, you try to stop that. I want people to come over. If I have a better system, they should come over. That's the way that the sets will roll out. <clears throat> and all this should be incorporated into your rollout plan. And this is something, a formal document you can show and say, look, here's where I'm going to pull over. Looking at the data analysis, this is how people are going to be dragged over. Now, let me just do an aside on resources. And by that, I mean people that are in a team, right? Uh, so 
if you're in a, a project that has a lot of visibility, and usually if your management is seen as part of the responsibility of the success or failure of this, uh, more resources may be added to your project to speed it up or even just to keep it on track. So are we going to make the deadlines? Um, you know, we still have a lot to work to do. And we decide, okay, let's drop in new developers. But the problem is that when you drop a new developer into a project, they are an initially, anyhow, a net loss of productivity. All right. You've got to look out, mentor the new programmer, uh, review their code a lot better. You've got to, you know, essentially bring them up to speed. And that siphons resources. When you siphon resources on a project, where are we doing this? Well, we're doing it as the project is nearing rollout. So we don't have time. And, uh, you know, if you throw half a dozen engineers at a project close to rollout, you can imagine what this does to the timelines. And, you know, I've actually been on our, uh, our current project where we were, I think, a, a month or a month and a half out from our first deliverable to clients. And we had 12 or 15 programmers dropped in uh, to work on the project. It really ground everything to a halt, <laughs> right? You can't drop 10 or 15 new people in and say, they're just gonna start producing, right? There's a, there's, a, a lot to, there's a lot to work out. So what are potential remedies of this? Well, I think one of the remedies that you can is, you know, if you're gonna add developers, try and do them early in the development cycle when the time pressures are not so crushing. And when you don't have the full system, you'll also benefit in that you'll get some new perspectives and maybe some help on problems that are going on. Or you can add specific training. And this is um, what I did in, in the project when we had a lot of new team members added in. I actually ended up going and putting a 10-hour <clears throat> course together to show uh, new programmers, here's how you work in the current infrastructure, here's how you write the pitfalls, what you got to look out for. And it really brings them up to speed a lot quicker. I mean, over time, there is no doubt that new engineers will give you a net gain in productivity, right, as far as code coming out. But you have to be careful. Of course, there's the other end of the spectrum, okay? And here you have what I call resource starvation. Um, the initial problems or the, uh, you know, the complaints of the problems has faded. Time heals all wounds. So uh, it's faded with time. Maybe you're being superseded by some other initiative. Um, but essentially, you have low visibility, right? And this is what I was talking before about business buy-in. And with low visibility, it's easier for, you know, your team members to get reassigned, especially if it's an informal team within a larger team. Let me drag, you know, Frank here and put him over here. Let me take Joe here and put him over here. And pretty soon you can find yourself on your own. Um, how do you combat that? I think you have to have worked on, in, you know, not becoming invisible. Uh, that's the problem. So again, resource starvation. How do you combat low visibility? Be more visible. Uh, how do you do that? There's a number of ways, you know, you can kick up, you can go explain how great this new thing will be. Uh, but it's it's not a concrete way of uh, that I have of doing it. So given these set of keys or these set of guidelines that you're trying to want hove to, uh, maybe we can have a different kind of, um, you know, graph of how we develop our, our, our project, right? So we have the project star, still plenty of enthusiasm. But we've gone and defined the scope by looking for definite problems that we're going to solve. All right. And once we have these definite problems to solve, we'll say, well, let's look at the realistic deadlines, right? We're going to look at the data. Let's look at the data in the legacy system. We can see where the real problems are. We're going to limit the scope. And because we have a limited scope, we can come up with much more realistic and defined deadlines, which I think is key. All right. It's not just very you know, very amorphous, fluffy, it's going to be better. It's like, here's what's going to happen. And because we have data-driven design, we're taking real, not imagined problems. And because of that, we're going to go into dev with a much better appreciation of the problem. Now, we start moving on to make our system work like the real world. We still have real world trouble. There's no getting away from that. 
And that real world trouble is going to need adaptation. Iteration, adapt, iterate, adapt. That's going to get you there. And hopefully you have your feedback loop short. So that's relatively quick. Again, you have a grand vision. You have a design. You're going to resist scope creep because you have something to cling to. Not that it won't adapt, but you do try and fit it into your broad framework or evolve your framework if it can't. But you can resist scope creep. Uh, you would be surprised that you know, if you deliver something that you have promised, even if it's limited in scope and you deliver it, it's a much better feeling than promising what you can't deliver and then going back and saying, I couldn't do it, or I deliver something that's half of what I said. So resist the scope creep. And you resist it by saying it's not needed now, and we will do it in a phase two or a phase three or a phase four, right? So resist. Resistance is not futile, contrary to what the board will tell you. And we have targeted milestones. We know where we need to get. We know the, the, the important parts of the project. If we've missed one, we'll have to add it in and hopefully adapt. We've adapting the design, all right? We're trying to keep to the real world. Again, I, 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 you know, I can't stress this enough. Observability in the real world is your best guide of how you're doing. Now, I can say, how far am I along? Am I on track? What is my progress? And even if I'm under a lot of time pressure, I have that set of deliverables and milestones. Where am I on them? Maybe I am going to miss my, my milestone or my deliverable, but I'm going to know about it, I think, a lot further in advance. And because of that, I'll probably get to execute a rollout, or if I'm not going to do my rollout when I say it, I can say months beforehand, I'll need more time. It's easier for people to absorb that than very close. So again, I have my rollout plan and I have you know, an idea of how I'm gonna drag the most use out of it early on. And that's gonna have me now asking me, not was my project a failure, but how successful is the project? And hopefully it's far more successful than what we've done so far. All right. So right now, I'm going to take a quick look. Um, the second part of the, the latter part of this talk is going to be talking about um, using these keys. And I, I've thrown them all up here. It's a lot of text. Um, I'll go come back to them at the end. But given these keys, can we apply it to the real world? Have we a concrete examples? And how close can we get there? And I'm going to take you through a case study of a project I worked on. And again, this project is, is drags from my, my years experience. I could stand here and, and talk about a lot of different projects, but I'm gonna focus on one where this stuff was applied. And at the time, I didn't have these keys formalized, but when I went back and looked, it seemed like I kind of followed them for the most part. So right now I'm gonna look at the question. Is there a story behind this talk? Uh, Claire, there are multiple stories behind this talk. Uh, I've been in, I, I think, close to 15 companies with the consulting, uh, a lot of them consulting, usually about, I think, a two year uh, time frame. And I am replete with stories where we've had this kind of thing happen, particularly where we let scope creep out. Um, we end up delivering a product that's not what we said we were delivering. And probably not what the user wanted anyway, because we had a bunch of misconceptions. We didn't have proper feedback loops. Um, so I, I could go on and on, and we're going to go on one here. The resort, most of these keys, I'm, I could drag from various things. It's not like every project had every one of these things wrong. There's you know a mix and match of what was done wrong and right in, in most projects. All right. Have you ever had difficulty convincing non-technical people about adoption of newer technologies to your project? How to tackle trade-offs between business value and adoption of industry trends and uh, best practice? Um, that can be, uh, you know, a bit of a, a lift when you try to say to the business, "I'm doing something underneath that you will see no visible improvement from," but just take it from me it's gonna be really nice and we're gonna have a much better system. That's a tough one, right? You'll just have to blend something in there that will give them some business value as well. And usually that's the way to get around that. I've had much more trouble with convincing 
uh, technical people that we don't need to go to a whole bunch of new technologies. All right. Uh, we don't need all these new technologies. These technologies are overlapping and we have something that will do just as good a job. It's just older. Uh, you know, let's not go there. Let's limit the, the amount of problems we potentially have for ourselves. I hope that answers that question. How do you spawn, how do you find people respond to being referred to as resources? I never use resources in anything other than a formal talk like this. Uh, you know, to me, people, they're all people. And, uh, you know, these are people I go to lunch with and stuff. Um, but I do have to talk to management and upper management in terms of resourcing. That's the language they understand. Uh, so I don't think they, uh, I don't think people know me and when I work with them, I don't think they'll, if I slipped up and called them a resource, they'd probably just jive me on it as opposed to uh, giving me any, you know, having some real hurt about it. Do you find, feel the industry moving to less documentation, overload of irrelevant documentation, misinterpreting from guidelines like Agile? How could we find a balance? I think we are. I think we are moving away from this whole idea of a huge amount of documentation, but maybe the pendulum has slid a bit the other way. I do think the best documentation for uh, how code is written is how code is written. And that means um, light on the comments, more on the expressiveness as, uh, as Kate Gregory's talks will go, goes into. And then that the documentation for how to, you know, as a programmer comes from, I think more from the unit tests. How do I use particular features? Or let me see how they're tested. And hopefully that's a good intro and I, um, that's the way I would look at that. And I'll answer maybe one more and then I'm gonna to have to move on to the, uh, the next part. Um, if you do a migration by function as opposed to by client, do the big clients that use several functions mind having to use both the new and old systems at the same time? How do you manage that? Uh, that again, that depends. <laughs> Right. Um, sometimes you can get away with saying that all this stuff is over here, but you know what? In the company, it's different groups. So one group it won't be flashing back and forth between the uh, you know the application. It will be like this group deals specifically in this. Well, this is the place to have them. Um, if that can't be uh, negotiated, then what you have to do is have something that can marshal both the old system and new system results on the front end part. Uh, much trickier, um, tends to degrade the design. Um, and we have some of that going on in my current project where we're moving people by essentially functionality, but they have to look at the one, um, you know, the one front end. And we've kind of been struggling a little with that. We've, you know, we've kind of moved clients over that where initially unifunction. And now instead of saying, well, a multifunction client, kind of functionalizing the group so we can move them over. All right, I'm gonna move back. I will come back to uh, the more questions at the end, but I'm gonna move back to the next part of the presentation. And let me get going again. So let me talk about Pilar. And I've, again, this is example, uh, people think this is all Bloomberg. This is just me looking over my industry experience and finding uh, you know, things that match up. So Polar is a case study, not the real name. Uh, all names have been scrubbed to protect the innocent and the guilty. So we have um, a system, a large system that received, enriched and processed trades uh, to determine whether they should proceed to settlement. And that involves some matching, some enrichment to figure out what was going on and could it proceed to settlement. Uh, the project rewrite uh, was initiated when the legacy system started, was taken, I don't know if it started, it was taken 30 minutes to process trades at market close, which is when you have some stampeding volumes. And multiple tickets for this were various clients would send in tickets saying, hey, this took a long time today. And these things were re usually solved because you can't just resolve a ticket by saying, well, that's too bad, was... Uh, the Polar system's in development. But when I came in on the project, it was 
over a year in existence. It had, I think, three or four people on it. There was no real plan, no real completion dates. It was more or less sort of, we're giving it our best effort. And we're not sure when it will go out. But when it goes out, you know, we're pretty sure it'll be, it'll be good. So I uh, took this project over, like I say, after a year. And, you know, subconsciously, to some degree, applied the lessons that I'm, I'm showing you now. So the things I needed, did I have a definition of success? I did. There was a definite problem that there was a category of trades that were taking 30 minutes to process. And this is really unforgivably long, even if we are being batch processed uh, by external systems. What about my team composition? Well, I had one, one long-time legacy system maintainer, so someone who had been in the project for 10 years and plus on the legacy system. One relatively new hire, uh, one guy that was around a couple of years, and myself. So. It was a nice blend um, to get going with. We had, you know, the new blood, the, uh, I, I myself, I figured having been around so long, I had some uh, architectural experience. And we had the legacy system uh, guy to, to, to help us out with, why is this going on? So the key requirement, number one, uh, analyzing how the data flows through the system. So uh, this is looking at the input composition. And when I looked at the input composition, it turned out that the trades came from, the category of trades that were having the problem came from two sources, uh, direct or via an OMS, which was having us do some of the work for them, uh, in a 53%, 38% split. Uh, looking then at the, the, the category of trades that was having this problem, it turned out that 90% of these trades were of what I'll call a type A, and five and a quarter percent were type C, and a miscellaneous was about four and a quarter percent. Type A and type C were just about the simplest trades you could handle, but were causing the most problems. Um, when I looked at the direct trades, so again, we have two sources. I, I focused on the larger slice of the pie, the direct trades. The top user accounted for 78% of the volume. And the next four users, if I put them in, it all came to 85%. So there's relatively few clients that were having problems on a relatively simple type of um, trade. And if you look at the pie chart up there, the yellow, um, this, this yellow piece here is the OMS sending us the type A trade, and this is the direct type A trade. So if I was able just to handle type A trades, that's 90% of the volume taken care of. And if I grab the, the other 5%, which again was pretty easy to do, I now have 95% of the trades. So, okay, there's another 5% outstanding, but that 5% turned out to be very esoteric, lots of dependencies hooked into them. And something that if we do want to get them, we'll get to them last. And we'll get to them with, you know, some, some kind of plan I don't want to come up with now. All right. So given that I looked at the input composition and seen that uh, the trades that I was looking for were, were, were pretty easy to get my hands on, the next thing I wanted to look at was what are the problems of these trades actually flowing through the system? And I seen that you know we had something that took the input trade, formatted it into our data structure, and then it was sent down to an enrichment process. Uh, this done many different types of uh, reference data enrichment. And what that caused to happen is that it was done serially in an arbitrary order. It wasn't like we started the, uh, the one that took the longest time first. So the whole thing was just a long chain for, for no reason then just happened to be designed that way. And the other big problem was because it was a long chain is any hang, hang up in the enrichment could freeze the system and freeze the trade showing up on the user screen. <clears throat> Looking at the peak time analysis, which is where most of the problem seemed to be getting voiced, it turned out that the throughput lagged due to not only volumes, but there was some throttling going on in there. And that throttling was so it wouldn't overwhelm the other part of the system, which was seen as more core to the business. 
And again, once a trade is pushed in and uh, someone doesn't see it for five minutes, they start thinking that, you know, time's out. They re-enter the trade. So we get lots of duplicate trades trying to come in due to the lag. So great. Um, I've, I think I've identified where the real problems in the flow and I've identified the category of, of input that is affected by this. However, again, the real world came in. Uh, when I had this nice presentation to business and management, a business came along and said, hey, there is a set of trades in there that need manual intervention. They don't just, uh, they don't just get cleared down to settlement. Uh, this would have been a, a, probably a showstopper because the manual intervention piece was held in another system that was way older and there would have been virtually no hope of me convincing them to uh, you know, re-up their system to work with this. And uh, it just would have derailed the project. Again, data analysis to the rescue. I took a look at the, so there was a, a flag, essentially a key inside of trades that could have manual intervention done. And when I looked at those trades that actually had manual intervention, there was only two and a, what about two and a half percent of trades that were had this manual intervention done. And furthermore, these trades were outside the scope of what I had targeted as the, two, the, the large volumes of trade in that original pie chart. So it was a non-issue. It was, these will be tackled in a later phase. Now, uh, producing design first and technologies later. Like I said, this thing had been around for about a year and they had come up with so uh, let, me, let me show you, here was the initial design. So again, we have something come in from fix from the outside, gets pre-processed into a data format structure, goes to enrichment, there's many enrichments, and then it goes to core handling, persisted to the database and sent out to the app. The new architecture they were working off of was like this. Everything was called new. Um, the only new piece I could see is that it was trying to use C++11 as opposed to the earlier version. And there was an in-house product that um, had come out that was essentially a blob database with distribution. So you could subscribe to wanting to know if something had changed. And this really was as far as we had gotten. This to me is a port. And if you go into port, go port on the old system, not the new system. So again, I went back and looked at the data that had come in. And instead of having a production line, we went to a hub and spoke model. Um, what this did is that when uh, input came in here through fix, it went down into the database with no IO, no processing and straight out to the user. So they would get a skeleton trade showing up on their system. So very, very fast to put something on the system. The enrichments were broken down to a bunch of blocks. There was reference data, external keys, permissions, uh, user data. This all happened concurrently. So what happened is when the trade came in, uh, it went out to all these enrichers, they worked on it. And then when they had it, they pushed it back in. Once they had performed that enrichment, so let's say we got a reference data come back in, it went straight out to the front end. Now, this enrichment usually happened in a way that you would not notice on the front end, particularly because a lot of it, you get a summary on the front end, and then you have to look at the details to see a lot of this data or do an operation where that data is being checked. But it was very fast. And uh, it also meant that any of these external enrichers, we could run multiple instances and they would just end up uh, working on it. So again, we went to a new model. Uh, dependencies were lessened and the parallel operations promoted. It was where we had seen the problems. It was scalable. And the technologies was an afterthought, though in fairness, I was asked to use the new product and I, cr I created my design and then seen how I could fit it in. And it fitted in quite nicely. But the design tackled real world problems based on my data analysis. That is the point to get over here, not what I perceive to be the problem. I was surprised when I found some throttling in there. And then because I had the historical 
perspective, I was told why it was in there. It overwhelmed the other systems during close, so they had throttled it. Next thing was deliverables and milestones. Well, first thing off is these tasks that were there were essentially, like I say, ported. I got rid of them and we designed from scratch um, the, the initial preprocessor using only these type A trades and show the deliverable was these trades showing up in the app. Something to show. We could see if the real world is tagging along where, where we need the product to be. The next thing was adding end enrichers. So all the enrichments that were needed, every deliverable was I've delivered an enricher. Now I can see that on the reference status screen. I can see it in details. Permissioning, I can see that, you know, just not me, but me and my delegates can see it. So each enricher showed more pr progress in the front end. The other milestone was to have QA automation. It turned out that I could not get any QA resources for this. The flat out told me no, um, which actually turned out to be a godsend because it was very manual. And we took the QA testing of the legacy system, again, analyzed their tests, got rid of duplicates and put together a set of tests. And now we were able to run this test in both beta and eventually when we went to production um, on, on the hour, do QA testing, whereas the legacy system was getting QA testing, I don't know, once a week, once every two weeks, something like that. But again, once we had the test, the QA system testing, and it didn't all just come as one big lump, it was, uh, you know, intervening the liberals were doing test A, test B, test C, but you could see the results of that test at the passing of that test happen. And I got an accepted rollout plan. And that accepted rollout plan said, here's how I'm going to roll it, how I'm going to put my value on the head of the project, not on the tail. Um, and then I had a plan for where, here's where the actual rollout, when I put all the deliverables and stuff together, it came out to about eight months, which was the end of the year, uh, would be the actual code rollout. And then I had a plan for turning clients on as well. Uh, iterative adaptive improvement. Well, you know, uh, we had cutthroat design reviews, uh, especially on new tasks, uh, usually cleaning up the code by 50%. We built now uh, conceivable problems that were way in the future, not addressed. That's what I call cutthroat provisioning. Limit that scope creep. Keep to your vision. Iteration being the key, we had design reviews by the group and code reviews by two people, but we prioritize code reviews over new work. Why are you working on new code when we have current code needing to be checked? Unit tests were a must for code acceptance, any enhance enhancement didn't go through code review without a unit test attached to it. And we had QA automation, which was a real godsend for, for catching problems. Observability. Well, you know, the basic system help checking is the process up we got for free, so it was there. But I had no telemetry or watermarking because way back then, it wasn't really a thing. And I wish it was. Uh, it's something I definitely missed and wish I had in there. How well was my system doing? And then halfway through the team, we, we came across starvation. Uh, you know, I lost one guy, then I almost lost two more. It almost became invisible. I'll tell you why we didn't become invisible. But due to the data analysis, large clients were targeted for the rollout, right? Pulled them up on the head of the, of the rollout, not on the tail. Now, after eight months of work uh, with a successful code rollout to production, no clients were actually using us. And that was a crying shame because it turned out that I knew it, but we had a dependency on another team. So we were part of an overall system. They had to shove work our way. They had to send requests. In dev and beta, we just duplicated the request so both systems got it, which was a nice way of seeing that the trades were handled at least equally, but wasn't a, a way we could do it in production. But you know, as luck would have it, and it's a strange kind of look, wait times had increased further in those eight months, I think it was up around 40 minutes, and the largest client made direct complaints to senior management about it as opposed to just going through the ticketing. And once that happens, visibility galore. So now I have visibility, it's what do you need to make this work? I just need about you know three days of work over here and a sister team. So it was done. 
And then we got the congratulatory email, the wait time for the system dropped, dropped under a minute. The clients essentially said it was no wait and everything was very happy. Now that was taking you know, a very restricted scope on just the direct clients. Uh, years later, I checked back in because I moved on from that project to uh, bigger, more uh, complicated things. It's still running. And I've talked to uh, the friend of mine who, who still is in charge of that. And he says it still runs. And I said, well, is it close to needing a rewrite or anything? And he goes, well, I don't know. It doesn't cause me any problems. It just runs. And as far as I'm aware, it's fine. Um, if I had metrics, I might be more comfortable with saying it doesn't need a rewrite, right? And I could say, hey, here's where we are. All righty, so uh, we're nearly out of time. Let me just talk about the keys again. So you need the key ingredients, you know, have definite measures of success to, to, to be able to scope your goals out and limit that scope. Your team composition, giving you some look back so you're not sort of naive. Uh, analyze the data flows through your system to locate the actual problems. I can't stress enough that this is something we just miss. Key to design, you take that data and you build a design based on it. And then you plug in your implementation technologies, not the other way around. Not, we have a technology, how can I use it? Chart your progress, observable effects is how it works. You can't show progress with just theory or feeling. And your short task timeframes will give you a resolution down to a day or so. The key to moving forwards, Iterate, adapt, iterate, adapt, and struggle to adhere to your overall design goals. Beware that the real world is messy. Very important thing. If you got a mismatch, you got to evolve the design, but evolve it in a good way. Don't just hack it. Deliver the product, iteration, keep your feedback loop short. It's the quickest way of getting something out the door. And once you have something, you can be confident it works by having meaningful metrics and alarms on those. And then move your users over sooner rather than later. Get the value at the beginning, not the end. Once you get at the beginning, you have more uh, credit to, you know, more hand in the game of I'll move more complicated things later, but I need other groups to help me out. And the key intangible, last one, what is the key intangible? I left it as question marks on the other slide. The key intangible is luck. You kind of need a little luck. Um, in my case, it was my, you know, we were getting invisible, but we got a strange kind of look and a complaint that made it. But when I talk to people who are have or are redesigning systems, luck invariably has some place in it. It's just lucky that this was going on. Again, my name is Pete Muldoon. Um, I don't know if we have time for questions. You can always hit me up in the Remo chat rooms. Um, you can hit me up on the Discord chat. Or you can um, ask me stuff now. I'm going to ask my track host. Do I am I out of time, uh, Mr. Track Host? I'm going to say silence means I'm okay. What is your view on agile me methodology in general? Does it really improve matters or not? I think, again, as a framework to start out, it's a good methodology. It gives you some ideas, but over time, it's like those training wheels fall off and you have the sense of what you're doing, but you're not a slave to Agile. You make Agile work for you, not you work for Agile. Which tools do you use for understanding bigger legacy system code bases? The debugger. Um, I put the thing in a debugger, um, probably unusual in that, and I follow requests through using a debugger or you know the log file if, if I can't do that. How do you choose programming languages for your software development? Is it based on team? Well, how I do it is I pick C++. I think it's the most fantastic thing ever, <laughs> but I've been working with it since about 1990. And um, you know I do like uh, the way the language goes. It's gotten a lot more complicated, but in my mind, it's kind of the way to go. Um, it's not suitable for everything, uh, you know, if you're doing something that's document manipulation, maybe Perl or, you know, unit testing, maybe it's Python. They do have their place, but for transactional low latency systems, high throughput systems, I tend to lean towards C++ to do heavy lifting, uh, Python, Perl to do medium lifting, and shell scripts to sort of put a framework of stuff on it. Uh, so... 
I think I've answered all the questions. Thanks for being here. And as I say, come hit me up. I'm quite approachable. I don't live in a lofty tower by any means. Come hit me up and talk to me after the talk. Thank you.